Um, and we are going to formally start the program. Um, I want to welcome everyone to our program. I'm Jeannie Braha, the Executive Director of Rock Creek Conservancy. The Conservancy is the friends group to all of Rock Creek National Park, and we use people-powered restoration to protect Rock Creek and its parklands as a natural oasis for all people to appreciate and protect. Before we start the formal program, I acknowledge that we're on the ancestral homelands of the Choctank and Costin and Piscataway people. I also want to make sure that everybody knows if you'd like to see live captions during this program, please uh, use the link provided in the chat box. This will bring up a second screen that has just captions. You may be able to arrange the virtual Zoom call and the captions on two separate windows on your screen side by side, depending on the technology setup that you have. And now on to the program itself. Um, last summer, I started to get phone calls about Melvin Hazen and I realized even though the Conservancy has a mini oasis, one of our demonstration restoration uh, forest sites in the Melvin Hazen West section of the park, we really had no idea who Melvin Hazen was. We had a general sense of what he had done. Um, and this led us on a process of discovery and we're just thrilled to have an opportunity now to share what we've learned and learn alongside all of you about um, this rather complex figure and, and all of the related issues. I want to thank the National Park Foundation whose support has helped to make this program and the Conservancy's broader efforts to address justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion possible, um, as well as many of our supporters. And I see several of our board members um, who have helped make this uh, process happen. By telling these sometimes uncomfortable stories, we create opportunities to confront our past and create a more equitable future together, as well as to identify stories and individuals who may not have been well known before. I'm now delighted to introduce my colleague, my partner in crime, Julia Washburn, the superintendent of Rock Creek Park. Thank you, Jeannie. Thanks and welcome everybody. I'm glad to see that we have a great turnout for tonight's panel discussion about Melvin Hazen and his legacy. Um, tonight's discussion is part of an ongoing series of events that Rock Creek Park and Rock Creek Conservancy are sponsoring on race and history as it relates to the Rock Creek Park lands. And we are just learning alongside all of you and enjoying that learning. And uh, it's, it's an important discovery process for us as well. Um, I'd really like to thank the Rock Creek Conservancy for tonight's event and all of that you do for Rock Creek Park and for the Rock Creek Watershed. We're really grateful for your partnership. And I enjoy being partners in crime with Jeannie um, <laughs> and her team. Um, I'm sure that you are all aware that there have been recent requests to change the name of Melvin Hazen Park. We received an ANC resolution and a letter from Congresswoman Norton on this topic. And we will be following up when we have more information to share. Um, I'm really looking forward to learning more about Melvin Hazen tonight alongside all of you. And with that, I will turn things over to the Civil War Defenses of Washington Program Manager, Kim Elder, who will be our moderator this evening. Over to you, Kim. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Jeannie. Appreciate the opportunity to um, serve as the moderator tonight. I'm looking forward to a really great discussion. We have, of course, two uh, excellent panelists who are going to lead the discussion tonight and, and provide a lot of background information for us. And then um, where we go from here with the information that we now know and, and what more do we, what more can we uncover? So to help us place our discussion into context tonight, I'm going to ask that we um, share the photo, the PowerPoint that we've prepared, just to help us put some context around tonight's discussion. So of course, tonight we're gonna to be learning a little bit more about Melvin Hazen. Um, as Julia as, and Je Jeannie have both noted, um, we have this park named after him, but many people don't know who he is. So tonight we're gonna to leave here knowing who Melvin Hazen is and the contributions and then some of the other um, um, significant and, and maybe even some of the insignificant things that he did to help shape our city, Washington, DC. So tonight, um, Let's just go through, next slide please, our, our presenters and our speakers tonight are Neil Flanagan. Neil Flanagan is an architecture designer, a freelance writer, and a historian who grew up right in Fort Reno. So he's played on that hill and he's very familiar with Washington DC and so it's a pleasure to be on this panel with Neil tonight. We also have as a speaker, Dr. Noel Lopez, who is a colleague of mine with the National Park Service 
and he serves as our region's cultural anthropologist. Both of these gentlemen come with a wealth of knowledge well beyond um, Melvin Hazen and Washington DC, but we're gonna tap into all that they know and all they can share with us tonight. So again, good evening, Neil, good evening, Noel, and I'm, I know that you two are excited to get started as well. So can we move to the next slide? So we wanted to make sure for those who are on the call, because of course with Zoom, you could be anywhere in the country, back outside of the country as well. We're talking about right here in Rock Creek Park, Melvin Hazen Park. Um, we've got a couple of, we've got the map as well as the this, this sign that we have on the trail marker. We also have a community garden that's named after Mr. Hazen. And then of course the park entry again, um, that last photo down on your right. Next slide. So um, Mr. Hazen was quite instrumental in acquiring um, federal uh, land for federal, uh, for the National Park Service specifically. Um, those areas include Piney Branch Parkway, Klingle Road Valley, Patterson Track, Fort Reno, and Whitley Park. And we just showed you some um, both um, era photos as well as current photos. Next slide. And then we have Reno past and present. So this is the old track for Fort Reno, the reservoir um, that we um, now know it's marked very clearly here um, where the National Capital Planning Commission purchased in 1920 um, versus the last phase of the commission's purchase and ended in 1951. Next slide, I think that's the final one as well. I think that is the final one. Okay, so we're gonna get right into our discussion tonight. We wanted to just ensure that you had some context as to what we're talking about um, and um, where we're gonna to go to this evening. I'm looking forward to a really great discussion. So again, good evening, Neil, good evening, Noel. Let's, um, let's uh, get right into some of our questions. So gentlemen, I'm gonna ask that you take a moment to help our audience um, know a little more about Melvin Hazen and what his role was in, these, in the DC government in context to what the government was at that time. Um, so before home, before home rule. So at this time, uh, Neil, why don't you take us the first stab at who was Melvin Hazen and his contributions to DC government and, and planning in DC? Absolutely, um, and, and thank you all for, ha uh, ha thank you for inviting me and, and I'm so glad they're having this conversation. Um, and I'm so glad so many people are interested. Uh, Melvin Hazen was a, was, a, was a surveyor. He was the District of Columbia surveyor. So um, he, uh, what that was is that he was in charge with managing the, some of the property records and the, the, geom the geometrical uh, uh, accuracy of maps for the District of Columbia. So property maps, street maps, and uh, a variety of other sort of things that were done by his office that are now done by other things like DCRA. So he, uh, he began his career in 19, uh, 1889 um, as part of a survey team. Um, the entry level position was called an ax man. And uh, literally what the job was, was to cut trees that down that were in the way of taking, sorry, I have a siren, taking, a, um, taking uh, measurements through uh, something called a transit theodolite. And it's very old fashioned technique. And there's also uh, all sorts of things can go into that, but um, he subsequently rose to the ranks and was very involved in the, the laying out of the street grid outside of the uh, old city, the so-called L'Enfant Ellicott plan uh, growing out, and then, uh, you know, rose to, to become uh, higher ranks, higher ranks in the offices responsible to those, again, those geometrical duties. Um, and uh, subsequently, subsequently uh, uh, became district commissioner uh, in, in 1933. Um, where he died, and he died in that office uh, in Jul on July fifteenth, uh, nineteen forty-one. Um, and so he, uh, only, that's that's the survey of his life. I won't, I won't stop there. Okay. Um, Neil, um, Noel, did you want to add something in reference to yeah. his bio? Actually, I was going to ask Neil about this because I think I read. You know, Neil's Neil. I have to say, has written a wonderful um, article in two thousand seventeen. Out, uh, quite a bit this whole conversation. Um, there's a section I think that, that you bring up, uh, Neil, uh, regarding um, what that commissioner position looks like. Or I think we, we actually want to chat about it before. Yeah. 
you mind explaining that? Because I think that you know this is this is something that doesn't exist really anymore in today's in today's world. So yes, luckily, luckily, yeah. I think that's a great point. Thank you. I, you're right. I, I should mention that. Um, so uh, as as Noah Cameron alluding to DC, DC and before uh, ni- uh, I always forget that it's 1973 or 1975 uh, did not have an elected government. It was appointed by uh, beginning in 1873 uh, and and going into the 1970s. It was uh, appointed by the president and the there was no legislative body in the District of Columbia in particular. The legislation was passed in two committees in Congress, House Committee, Senate Committee on the district. Um, And then the commissioner therefore was kind of a more like a city administrator. Um, And there were three commissioners uh, on the board, one of whom was always from the United States Army Corps of Engineers. And that guy frankly was the city manager and did most of the work. Um, And the other two were sort of more uh, individuals who are, you know, had a lot of ceremonial functions and, and did do a lot of work uh, each on the project and the, the city. And they would have portfolios in similar to way that like uh, in the Westminster system of government, different ministers have different, they all, they all kind of the same rank, but they have different portfolios as I say. So one guy might do schools and police, another guy might do streets and stuff like that. Um, so that's, it's a, it's sort of a, and he, his position in particular was as chairman, which is the, again, taking on more symbolic uh, roles and so he was uh, very well liked in his in his sort of role of um, you know opening schools and things. So Noel, could you speak to perhaps um, Hazen's um, history with the Macmillan plan and some of the acquisitions with the federal lands? Um, <clears throat> so with the Macmillan plan, uh, maybe maybe we need a little more. Uh, yeah. I'm- I'm gonna actually rely on on, mm-hmm. okay. on Neil for some of this stuff because okay. honestly, I think that that you know one of the problems we have with DC is that it's really hard to understand like these different plans and the way they work. Absolutely, absolutely. Or Very maybe not they're difficult to understand, but they really provide an, an uh, there's this um, these different eras sort of that we've had these sort of design plans on the city, and two of the major ones is Lef- is the um, uh, Lafont plan, and then also the uh, Macmillan plan are sort of the two major ones. And when we think about like the center part of the city, sort of the center um, uh, hub of early DC and then, and then the plan for the rest of the city. Um, and uh, like, honestly, uh, Neil, I hate to, to lean on you, but being, a, but being an architect, I feel that you really are the one who knows this side of the work. So what what is it about the Macmillan plan? Why do we still hear about it today? Yeah, so this is a, that's a great, it is true that uh, it's a great point. I'm happy to take this one on. Um, the, the Macmillan plan, um, uh, well, let's, let's, step, let's, let's step back and say like, you know, there's plans and then there's implementation. I think that's yeah. actually a really key distinction of where Melvin Hazen comes into this, right? So like I was saying, there's the, there's the original plan of the city called the, which is called the Lafont plan. It's revised very heavily by a guy named uh, Ellicott. Um, and that's kind of what we get today. Subsequently to that, uh, DC started building suburbs. And if you know uh, the suburbs, uh, we, we think of them in, we don't think of them as cities as suburbs because they're in the city, but like Mount Pleasant where the street grid is really crazy. Um, in the 1880s, um, uh, you know, sort of government officials became very concerned about that, that pattern, the sort of ir- un- irregular pattern of subdivision out there. And they passed a series of laws that, uh, that uh, ultimately created Melvin Hazen's first position um, that a lot, that established a, a street grid. And it was slowly revised over the 1890s and that in the 1890s, um, but it was seen as kind of just commercial. It's like, it was like Manha- the Manhattan grid, right? It's just sort of how to squeeze the lots in and, and not make the roads too complicated, not too curvy or, or too steep. Um, although anyone who lives in like Edgewood knows that they didn't do a great job of that. Um, they, uh, subsequently to that, uh, the, uh, it appears to actually have had the involvement of, of France, Senator Francis Newlands, who was found very active in Ward 3, and we'll get to, well, it was now Ward 3, and we'll get to him, um, led to the creation of a, of a committee, uh, of a commission uh, that hired a team of crack architects called, that became known as the Macmillan Commission, after Senator uh, James Macmillan um, of, uh, I think, Michigan. And uh, they, they included uh, leading, leading lights of what is known as the City Beautiful Movement, and they came up with this very, uh, very monumental sort of uh, plan for DC. They basically uh, proposed turning most of what had been uh, residential neighborhoods down right on the mall um, into uh, a very, very large park full of a sort of symbolic 
these sort of symbolic mon monuments. And that's a bit more or less the tone that was built. The problem was their plan was ridiculously expensive. Um, and no one really wanted to spend the money on DC. So uh, for as much as, as beautiful as the plan, as beautiful as the plan is, and we learn about it right in architecture school, what you don't learn about is that it kind of sat unfinished or, and was only finished piecemeal until the 1920s. That uh, I would say that the Macmillan plan was more of a vision until about 1927 when the um, federal triangle sort of starts to get underway. Um, but it was, you know, they had to fight piece by piece to build. They had to fight to build the Lincoln Memorial and then they stopped. And, you know, that's so, and um, it also included a, an extensive plan for the streets outside of DC. They wanted to beautify uh, the streets, uh, the areas outside of DC. So again, get away from that commercial grid. Uh, so that's, and that's where Melvin Hazen comes in is, is advocating, uh, I think largely for, for the acquisition of parks identified in the Macmillan plan, um, but not yet purchased uh, in, in his capacity as surveyor. So, and part of these plans is also the circle forts, correct? Or the- um, Precise. Uh, correct. So they weren't called circle forts, they were called the circle- Fort Circle. Fort yeah, Circle. Fort Circle, Fort Circle Parks, that's correct. So this is one of those one of those you know uh, you know anyone who's traveled around DC sees all these these um, earthen works that we have throughout the city the Fort Dupont Fort Reno um, and there was a plan to sort of, to sort of link them together if I'm not mistaken that is so correct it's a beautiful um, uh, uh, verdant or green uh, tour that you can take from from fort to fort uh, that encompasses a city uh, and that plan never really uh, it, it, it never went any, any further than simply acquiring some of the spaces, but it was used as a, as a pretext for a lot of the, um, the work that Ma Melvin Hazen was, was pursuing, uh, yep. citing this, citing this, uh, this, uh, you know, eventual park that would encompass the city, um, as an excuse, as an excuse, but as a pretext for, for, um, uh, buying up the land or, or getting the land uh, under um, under his domain. Absolutely. So I want to just go right into referencing, um, if you go back to um, older articles about Hazen, in fact, the article that we featured in that slideshow, when we opened up, it referred to him as the boss. Um, he was often referred to as the first citizen of Washington because he worked tirelessly to improve this layout, the lands that we now know as DC. But we also know that he did a lot of things that weren't always favorable for all of the residents of Washington, D.C. And so I want to just make sure that we kind of highlight some of those things that he did. We talked about, we kind of listed those places that he, that he worked in. But if we can now move into some of the things that very little know about uh, Hazen, and specifically, maybe we can even talk about the Alley Dwelling Act, um, where we had the issue with class and race. And so I want to punch that out to either one of you all that want to take a the first stab at that and talk about the uh, alley dwelling act. Um, so I'm gonna, <laughs> again, as, as the leaving, letting the architect be the architect. I think, the, I think the, though this is a really interesting one with the alley, alley, alley dwelling um, act, because I think it sort of is like the first impulse to, um, to start the, the, uh, the sort of a more formalized process of clearing. Yes certain areas out, I, you know, up to that point, if I'm not mistaken, to clear um, housing out, it had to be clear, declared like derelict or, or um, uh, non-livable. And then uh, you'd have to take it to court and there would be, uh, you'd have to, to argue for right of eminent domain to, to tear it down. Um, and the Alley Dwelling Act supposedly, I think the intent was sort of to, um, to provide, to, you know, this, if there was like an impoverished or unsanitary housing to, uh, because uh, at the time, um, a lot of many alleys in DC or in some of DC were, uh, or a lot of homes were for, that would be fronted, we'd see on the road, but have alleys that would have uh, entire communities living there. It was a very vibrant alleyway uh, community life uh, that existed in the city. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of those people were living in uh, conditions that were that were not necessarily the the best for them, but on the other hand, they were they were actually being able to survive. So the, the city or um, the Alley Dwelling Act, the the idea behind it was that they would they would um, clear out the alleyways and we refer to them as slums. I think sometimes, 
and, um, and then provide housing uh, either there or elsewhere. I'm not sure about if the housing was supposed to be replaced immediately nearby there or not. Mm -hmm. So I think the first case was maybe there were 11 dilapidated homes, uh, I think on K Street. Uh, the, the ADA was used in a large way, and uh, they ended up uh, coming back and creating 12 new homes. And the interesting part of it is, I, I believe that uh, the labor was all done by the uh, Works Progress Administration. So yeah. they're supposed to contract it, and I think it became it fell under uh, WPA in some way. Um, Neil. Yeah, and that's a that's a great. Uh, there's actually there actually I've I have not ever actually looked at the files, but at the I don't know if you know, DC has its own archives. The DC archives has a very large uh, set of files related to the implementation of, of its public works under the Works Progress Administration, which is pretty cool. I hope someone digs into that someday. Um, it Works Progress and Public Works, they they did both of them. Um, so the the alley, the alley situation, as as Noel said, is you know is it, there were um, Afri a lot of African Americans, particularly the poor, and as well as a lot of poor whites, lived behind. The main house, right? So DC's blocks are very big, and so behind the big blocks uh, would be these little alleys, and they were seen as as rife with crime and um, and and unhealthy conditions. You have to remember, no one, a lot of most most people most people uh, when they were built didn't have plumbing, um, and by the time of the 1910s, the gap between the front houses, which had plumbing and started to have electric had electricity, certain maybe started to even have other kinds of of utilities. Um, they, the gap between the two became very apparent. Um, and oftentimes the, you know, it was, uh, they were seen as sort of a, um, both a, a social contagion and as well as a racial contagion. It's, it's really conflated. And people would, see, because the alleys were in the back of houses, they were seen as breeding grounds for crime in the sense that, uh, that the people from respectable society or, or white society couldn't surveil what was going on. And a great way to look at this, as Noel said, is uh, when they would build housing uh, under the uh, second incarnation of the Alley Dwelling Act, uh, created this authority called the Alley Dwelling Authority, which later became the National Capital Housing Authority, and then later became DC Housing Authority. So if you look at, uh, if you've ever seen something like Berry Farm, you'll note that there are no fences. When you see the old Berry Farm, which has been demolished, uh, there are no fences, very clear sight lines, that kind of uh, sense of that, that there's nowhere for dirt to get trapped, Nowhere and nowhere for anyone to hide uh, was a, was a very key part of the the I, I, ideology that saw these as irreparable, right? It's not just that they needed to be cleaned up; it's that they were irreparably contaminated. Um, so there were a series of of uh, there's a, a series of of efforts to clean up particularly bad alleys uh, beginning in the 1890s, um, which I think the first one that they kind of go after is called Willow Tree Alley. Um, I think it's, it's been studied pretty well, um, but I, I could be wrong about that. Uh, and then subsequently in, in 1913 um, and 1914, there's a series of, of bills that are put through Congress to create a systematic clearance of the alleys. Um, and that is done without any anticipation of replacing the housing. It's just seen as a simple slum clearance project. Um, that stopped because uh, it's a huge, it just costs a lot of money. Um, there actually was significant opposition, uh, not just from, uh, from Afri the African-American residents, but also from the, the landlords, uh, because the slums were profitable, and, the, uh, and from uh, just generally the fact that it would cost a lot of money to do it. Um, that sort of stalled, and it was delayed again and again and again until uh, the 1930s, when, when, the, when a new, under the New Deal, uh, a more uh, progressive strategy, so to speak, where they would, of building housing in, in uh, to replace the alley housing was enacted. Unfortunately, it was not always in the same location. They tried to in some cases, but um, a lot of times it ended up with relocating uh, African Americans, the residents of these, of these uh, organizations, whether intentionally or unintentionally, uh, out of their communities. A, a story that's very common in America. Yeah. Um, and wasn't um, uh, Wilson's first wife involved in some of, the, some of these alleyway clearings? You know, I know that I've read. Absolutely but I had never seen it associated with um, Melvin Hazen or sort of this story, but Wilson's house, Wilson's uh, first, was it uh, Edith, I think Wilson uh, was, might've been involved. Uh, I think that's right. Yeah, I think it's Edith. Yeah. Yes, that, that's absolutely correct. Um, and it was seen, the bill was seen as a, the 1914 bill was seen as a legacy of hers, sort of a, a tribute to hers. Um, and um, they, uh, 
Um, yeah, and then that's that's a that's a good point. But Melvin Hazen was not involved in the actual legislation of this in any way, uh, yeah. but he was he was tasked to um, to implement it. And so uh, in the in the files of the DC archives, there are large numbers of, of documents from him exploring how how it would be done, um, and you know different strategies and I, nothing particularly incriminating. But he seemed to believe very strongly in the mission. So we've covered quite a bit of his um, his contributions to the to the commission. Uh, very early on, and I wanted us now to move um, a little bit um, post Civil War time now, and we're talking about Reno and the founding of Reno and Reno City. So, um, would you share a little bit about the history of Reno City? Who lived there? How does it relate to the Civil War? Um, what what actually was going on? And are there individuals that we know of that we can sort of cite that were were advocate for Reno City. We, we, some of us know that history, but a number of us don't. So I like to assume that we don't know that history and we kind of give a real quick synopsis of what was going on and what, what made Reno City stand out so much. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let me just uh, preface this first by just pointing one thing out, which is right now we're, we're in the middle of working on a historic resource study regarding uh, the sort of history on Reno mm -hmm. uh, or Reno. Um, and one of the questions that I've had from the beginning uh, as the regional anthropologist has been about um, looking for uh, descendants of people that were um, part of the quote unquote contraband camps or free, uh, freedom seekers who were um, found uh, housing near or found work near um, uh, Civil War forts. Um, and I just want to point this out because it's been a question that I've had from the beginning. <laughs> I've been and I, we've definitely been searching for, for to find sort of this, you know, uh, a direct connection between the people that lived in, in Reno City or Reno um, after the Civil War and one of these camps. And up to this point, it's even though the, you know, this, the story persists, um, the evidence of that early um, establishing a direct connection or di direct relationship between the camp or a camp and the descendants of the people who ended up establishing or being some of the first African Americans in Reno City has yet to be sort of teased out and found. So it's still at this point inconclusive, um, but we're, we're working on the research to, to sort of make a determination about that. But um, what I love about uh, Neil, and I hate to go, to go back, to, but Neil really is, is, has been a font of information. I've just tracked through what everything he's written. Has been that he points out of the or even the early period of um, a family. I think it was called Willow. Uh, uh, the, the name of the original name of the farm before it became displaced and turned into uh, Fort Reno. Uh, Neil. Neil, you're on. You're, the, okay. the, I'm sorry, the Dyer family. Are you talking about? Yes. The, uh, yes. Yeah. They were the original property owners. Yes. Um, but but anyway, so we've tracked it down and we've been trying to make this determination whether or not we can we can identify. Um, if any of the descendants were, we've and we've have yet not been able to find anything conclusive at this point. Yeah. But research is 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 ongoing. Um, so hopefully soon enough we'll be able to provide a little bit more clarity on that. So let's talk, Neil, then about what was Reno City. Yeah. How did it come about? Let's let's start from there. Let's, let's talk about the fort, the war, and then what happened after the war, and 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 voila, Reno, Reno. Okay. Absolutely. Well, so so Noel's point is, is really good. And I think it's really important that I, and there's been some really, I've seen some of the, the, the research that he's talking about. And it's really, it's really interesting. Um, what I'd say is that, you know, who, you know, who cares whether Reno came from the Civil War or not, right? Uh, what's interesting is that uh, African Americans chose to make their life there. And they found this to be a particular, particularly good spot to do it. Um, some of that seems to have been associations with a church. So when we look at, uh, called the Rock Creek Baptist Church, which, um, still exists, I think is in Prince George's County now. Um, they, uh, you know, they, there seems to have been, you know, seems to become a sort of hub for African-Americans living in the rural outskirts of Washington, DC, uh, beginning in the 1870s. Um, so after the, so the, the, you know, it starts, starts, it starts in the wake of the Civil War and particularly the Dyer family uh, leaving the property. Uh, but it, it really starts to mature. And I think it matures through three phases, right? It has this, this rural sort of center of, center of, of the community uh, centered on its churches, and then it starts to develop into a little bit more of a, a community that's uh, for sort of working class people who serve the, the uh, um, 
the railroads, the streetcar suburbs as suburbanization and some light industry starts to move out into the, into the, out of the old city. And then the third phase, it starts to become really a proper, a, a community that's almost suburban. Uh, we start to see a more professional, professional class and, and a, a more uh, affluent African-Americans starting to move into the community. Um, and at the same time, you start to see white uh, people moving into the community too, because it's, it's a really great location. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's a tension there because some of the, some of those white people did, did not want the black people around others did. Um, but there, there does seem to have been uh, a pretty interesting community at its peak, which I would say has probably been about, uh, 1915. Um, and what I believe is that, uh, evidence suggests that, um, as it was, what, what actually was most concerning to the white residents around Reno was that it was becoming more stable, that it was becoming more, uh, affluent. Um, in fact, what we see is uh, a number of people who are involved in this incident called uh, the development of a neighborhood attempt to build a black neighborhood in Chevy Chase called Belmont uh, per, uh, began op, uh, looking into Reno. So that in particular is how uh, Reno's greatest advocate, a guy named James Neal, seems to have become involved. He may have tried, he may have been trying to re reproduce this effort to build a, a, a suburb in a nice part of town for African Americans. And we know that one of the leaders of uh, the citizen, the Reno Citizens Association, so if you know the term Citizens Association, it's usually associated with white people, civic is usually uh, black people. That distinction wasn't present in 1910. Um, uh, his name is Zachary T. Thomas, and he was very successful at agitating to uh, get resources to Reno, in particular uh, lighting the streets, getting uh, more water hookups. Because mm -hmm. um, al although it's next to a it's next to a reservoir, a lot of the houses were not uh, readily hooked up to water. Ironically enough, right? Um, so Reno, Reno is a really, is a complex place. And it, it, I think that the fact that it was associated with civil war is interesting, uh, but really it's, it's important to take it on its own terms in the, in the, by the time as it develops 40 years later. And, and let me just add, um, because this is in, in my bill forward as well, but that Reno city was, um, was a very affluent. And like, as you said, at the peak of it, it was very affluent. They, these yeah. were educated African-Americans. Yes. They were sending their children to sending their children to the newly founded Howard University, um, lawyers and doctors. And so, um, again, this wasn't this blight condition that was yes. described later on. Um, yeah. That was definitely what they used to, to bring right. their case before the, before the Congress. It also seems as if, um, um, and I think you'll probably get into uh, James Neal later on, but one of the things that happens is that as um, as his sort of more experimental ventures in in development start, you know, being doors start closing on him, he realizes more and more the importance of a community like Reno. Yeah, and I think that's that it goes very closely to what you what you sort of write about this idea that that this becomes a um, uh, a hill to, to sort of to, to plant your flag on. Absolutely. Yes. Um, uh, you know, the, the, as the, you know, it's one thing when you try to establish something new, but there is already an established community there that is, that, that has a level of agency. Um, they either own or rent and, um, and they have a willingness to stay. Um, that, that creates a, um, uh, something that can't be easily dislodged by, by um, Hazen or any of these other plans. They, they can sort of resist. In very in very important ways, and in fact, I think that um, that the resistance that they do offer is is fascinating and really lays out sort of some of the early um, battles that later on, when we talk about gentrification and things like that, um, sort of themselves. But seeing the way that you know the the fact that um, that Neil sort of has these these plans in other places and they don't quite work out because he's trying to find trying to establish these. Uh, you know, very um, affluent, um, or some of that. I mean, at least with I think it's Belmont is the one that was yeah. very affluent. It was supposed to be um, uh, next to or near a, a series of other developments that were of of white communities mm -hmm. that, that were also affluent. And uh, when they realized, they they shut it down immediately. Yeah. Yeah, well, actually, well, that's 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 a that's a great point. And I, I think that to, to the the point of the land, you know, why is land important to Black people? I mean, it, um, why why would it be in this case? And I, I think that it has held a historic importance, uh, particularly to uh, uh, 
African Americans because um, it's it property rights in America are very strong and they were much even stronger uh, back in at this time and that property right that in, in you know in many um, you know it entitles you to a lot of rights I mean how many times have you gone to a community meeting where people remind you that they're homeowners right um, the uh, that that ability to escape uh, harassment is another reason why you might pick a why a lot of African Americans actually made their homes. Uh, even when they had a little bit more means on the fringes of, of cities, because it was just a way to avoid uh, this being kind of being watched um, and, and sort of cause having uh, friction. Um, so I think that, um, you know, the, the land is when the civil rights were not very strong, the property rights are a way of insulating yourself and, and, and claiming something on it and, and, you know, having wealth, having wealth that is hard to get rid of. Um, and, that, and that really is something that James Neal talks about when he goes to the Senate hearings, he's, he, he, actually talks about that he's not getting enough money for some of the land. Um, in addition to, he doesn't want to just, he's like, you're gonna, you're gonna kick all these people out and we're not getting the money for it. Exactly. Um, I think that uh, is something that certainly was on his mind. Um, you know, one of the, one of the people at that, at that hearing says something along the lines of, um, I moved out of the, he basically says he got out of, out of downtown to move out of the way of the people that, that, that hated him. Yeah. And he found himself surrounded by the people that hated him. Uh, yeah. 20 years later. So um, it's interesting that that they were moving to what they thought was a fringe of the city. And it, at the time it was, I mean, that was really, um, it was, as you said, it was a rural uh, um, suburb. And uh, suddenly they found themselves in extremely desirable space uh, all around. Yeah. So the, so the, Reno, the Reno citizens found themselves facing a, a a, a case of eminent domain, and they right. head down to the U.S. United States Capitol to fight their case. Yes. Um, how was what, where was Hazen? What was going on? Let's let's bring Hazen back All into right. this discussion of what was going on with Reno City and and the residents of Reno fighting for their home ownership. If ever there's a story, a part of the story that could be made into a movie, I think yeah, this that, would be the, yeah. the the highlight of the story. Right. This would be the part where everyone comes together and, and really, um, uh, uh, um, you know, it's, it's the team that everyone wants. Um, Neil, I think that you, this, you really do a great job of highlighting this. So I'm, I'm gonna interject in it, okay. some other parts, but that, around what you wrote, but I really wanted to talk about not just that, but like the, the fact that they, you, that they were even unaware of what was happening up to that moment. Right. Exactly. So, in the DC archives, I found evidence that they were aware. Okay, now I'm trying to hit this Zoom now. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I hope you can. Uh, the uh, we we uh, in there is a letter from a man named uh, E. Molyneux Hewlett, who is a very prominent African American lawyer, who in 1923 sends a letter to um, sends a letter sends a letter to uh, the District of Columbia government to the, to the engineer commissioner at talking about the interest. Uh, the first move that was made there, which was attempt to buy a little bit more land for the reservoir. And he basically outlines that they, he says that we've been, you know, the residents have been harassed by real estate brokers. Uh, now you're coming for our land. Uh, excuse me if this seems like um, a little bit suspect, like that you're trying to, a lot of people might, someone, he sort of in loyally sense, it's like, you know, someone might suspect that you are, you know, trying to kick out the black people. Uh, so they were somewhat aware, but it's it's well, but not to be too disagree. I mean, they did not know the laws were in in, in Congress. That that I bet they did not know. But what's what, it is interesting that, um, but you know, when they know, they they sort of have an expectation that something is has been going on, and they're ready to fight. They're ready. So that's that's not that's that's news. That's news that I've never talked about. Yeah, I don't think, and I, I don't think we have anything about that in in any report. So at nope. some point, let's chat about this offline about that. And I think that um, that uh, that the there is, and I think that you're the one who mentions it. This idea of a um, of a quote unquote plan, like this, yeah. like this is a plan, and and it it may not be. And I guess a plan would be that that um, that city government or that yes. were specifically targeting black owned spaces to displace them, buy it up at a lower rate, and then jack up the after they've been after they've moved out and while that plan might not be something that was ever written it clearly was the the um, action that was done time and time again throughout the city and in particular in, in this story itself 
as you pointed out, James Neal uh, complains that I think they were offering him 10 sets a foot or something. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. and I, it, was, it was far too low f in comparison to what everyone else is getting. In, yeah, in, he said, He said. in fact, he's quoted saying, you couldn't buy a chicken coop with what they're offering us for our homes. Yeah. So yeah, that, that went down in the records for the congressional records. So Neil, let's let's continue to talk about what, what's going on. So they, All right, right, right. they go down to the they go down to the Capitol to state their case. What's what's Hazen saying and how? And let's talk about his. I mean, he was dead set on making this happen. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So they go down to they go down to the they go down to Cong congressional committee, and, and we're talking about this is an old school committee, so it's it's in the old main Capitol building, and the, they probably were sitting at a conference table with each other, right? I mean, this is close quarters, and they, uh, they go in and, and the two primary witnesses for the plan, for this plan that's developed in 1924, show up, don't show up. So Charles Glover and uh, Franklin J, J. Franklin Bell, who are the, the engineer commissioner, right? So they don't show up. So Hazen is uh, given the responsibility of showing it. And he, he talks about how uh, the Reno, which was built before, long before uh, the street, uh, there was a street grid, um, in particular, uh, you know, in that kind of willy-nilly suburbanization that was that Melvin Hazen hated so much, and was was basically put in the government to get rid of. He talks about the problems uh, of of the disorderly street grid and how it basically has to be completely restarted from scratch because he uses the term "wiped out." So um, he uh, and he talks about also about some some some, some slum, what he considers kind of slum conditions. Um, but they, you know, he repeatedly insists that it is just for public good and there's no private interest, right. no sort of racial interest. And of course, James Neal does not have any of that. And there's a, there's a lengthy, there's a pretty interesting back and forth. And um, I think effectively what uh, they're, they're, they, you hear both from James Neal and his, his associates, a man named Thomas C. Johnson, I think is there. Um, and you hear also from a number of Reno residents uh, who speak, speak up and speak in, in very different, uh, and maybe we're from the older, uh, less affluent uh, substratum mm -hmm. arena, um, and also a really fascinating talk by a discussion by a man named Samuel Hebron, um, and uh, they successfully defeat this. But in the process, two things happen. First, is that Hazen starts to talk about uh, how there was a, there was a, some kind of plan that was hatched, and it was hatched in a uh, maybe beginning as early as 1914, uh, but a little bit more concretely in the, in 1920 that Hazen seems to have sort of shepherded through the DC bureaucracy. Uh, the first plan is to do something that uh, where they would buy up Reno, all the land, wipe it clean, and then sell off uh, the land that was not streets. And this is a practice called excess condemnation. And it had actually just been sort of started to be developed um, in uh, urban planning circles. And originally has to do with uh, sort of recapturing the value of public investment in, prop in, in, in land, right? If you build a street, the land next to it is more value. You put, a, you put street lights in, the land next to it is more valuable. We put a park in, the land next to it is more valuable. So how does the government recoup that? But, but Hazen takes this approach and, and sort of doesn't, doesn't look at it that way. Does, he doesn't use that the, the way that the originators use it. He uses it in a way that's much closer to urban renewal, right? Which is that you buy, he proposes buying up the land and then reselling it to people um, with, with some, maybe a profit, but not necessarily okay. a public good. Um, that doesn't go anywhere because again, property rights are very strong and it's seen as, it's seen as a bizarre uh, foreign doctrine. Um, so he comes back in 1920 with the proposal that uh, with working with a white citizens association, it seems uh, from the documents, and we, we can't say anything with certainty. Uh, he shows shepherds this idea that it could also be turned, the, what the Reno neighborhood could be turned into a park. And in the, in the congressional hearing, uh, another district official shows up and actually brings out the book of the Macmillan plan. So there's a book produced with the Macmillan plan. Um, and I, I don't know the details of that publication, but um, they, uh, he shows, I guess, on a map. And then there's a narrative description actually in the Macmillan plan of, of that Reno was supposed to be taken for a, as a hill. Um, and it has a photograph actually of, of the town in the, in, in the book. Um, that seems to get a little more traction. And then uh, in 1923, around the same time that Molly New Hewlett is, is corresponding about the loss of, uh, a loss of land for the, for the water, uh, several, several white, uh, a white realtor who represents a company called the Cherry Tees Land Company uh, shows up and says, uh, writes to Hayes and says, well, that idea from back in 1920, why don't we do that instead of buying this up piecemeal? Because I don't like the way that this has, I don't like the way this, the park uh, cuts up the neighborhood. So he, 
uh, Hay so this uh, this man, this Harold Doyle and, and Hayson seem to start to collaborate and they, they forward letters back and forth um, until a, uh, a meeting occurs uh, to discuss the value of, of clearing Reno on uh, February 6th, 1924. Um, at 2 p.m., we have we have documents from it, and a bunch of lead, a number of leaders, including probably the most uh, powerful people in D.C., uh, sit together and, and and actually sort of agree in a, this back room at the district building, the Wilson Building, uh, that Reno should be uh, cleared. So that comes up in the hearing, um, and uh, Hazen actually does a does a plan. He does a, a drawing uh, proposed for the park, which he presents at the at the hearing, and there's a. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it seems like uh, James Neal was able to, to actually make the congressman sweat that there was actually a little bit of anxiety. So the bills are, we, we know from evidence that's in the DC archives, we know the bills were submitted by the, the Chevy Chase Land Company. Um, uh, we found evidence of that. Um, and the, uh, uh, and nevertheless, it's just kind of done as a political favor because you know, they're, they're socializing at the same clubs, you know, down at the Cosmos Club and all this, the nice clubs downtown. Um, but uh, ultimately, it's no political advantage to any of these guys to stick up for this plan. Right. Um, and so James Neal seems to sort of fight it back pretty well, sort of. But it turns out there are other mechanisms that are put in place. But let's leave it there because that's where Hazen ends in the story. All right. So then we now know that this, this ongoing fight is happening. So what's, what's, the, what's the decision? What's the ultimately the decision? And when did that decision take place that Reno would be raised and or in and in Hazen's words wiped out. What, what was right. what was what was the year and and what when the decision finally came down? How did that happen? So well, yeah, yeah, asked, one, I'm sorry. I was going to ask go you ahead, was go ahead. one thing. Like was it even because it strikes me as if it was it was done uh, almost piecemeal in the end. Like you know, yes. sort of, let's turn the water off and let's see if people get upset and then eventually. Okay. You know, if, if there's enough blight, maybe some people will move out and we'll buy that and we'll slowly start acquiring uh, bits and pieces and, and make the entire, make the community basically unlivable over time. Uh, in fact, what I was going to say beforehand with your story, the, in, the, in the records, there's this great moment where, um, where uh, there's a question that's asked of people that were there, that were representing the community. They're part of the, um, uh, the Reno City, uh, the Reno... Civic Association, Association. Uh, if they were willing to sell it, they had a fair price and everyone, uh, the people present, you know, in the, in the gallery all yell out, no. And so um, it's, just a, it's a great moment of sort of, of people rushing and, and stopping something. Um, really, uh, this was in Hazen's mind, as you said, from 1914. And he, yeah. it seemed to doggedly to have been pursuing, looking for different ways of acquiring this land um, and going through different mechanisms. And, and that, you know, that moment provided the clearest one where he could just all together sweep in and get it. Right. I don't know if, he, if they could have afforded to do the work properly. Great question. They were even asked if they had a place to, if they displaced all these people, could they, were they gonna get housing? And he said, no, there was no, no plan whatsoever for housing for any of them. Which is which? Which just goes to show, uh, you know, the desire for the land versus exactly. the, about the community. Um, so the both okay. of you are historians and great storytellers. Now you've got us at this cliff. What happens? Right. What, what happens oh. with Reno? So uh, what happens? What happens at Reno is actually there's a very clever something very subtle that was done. Is why well, you got to read the fine print. Is that uh, the first takings in Reno were done for um, for the for the reservoir? And then for uh, the uh, what is now Alice Deal, so in the in a uh, I think 1925 appropriations bill there is a specific mention that a school sh two schools shall be built in the Reno subdivision, mm -hmm. and uh, what happens is that uh, the first takings start to go, uh, they start to buy upland and then they initiate court proceedings and James Neal shows uh, uh, represents Samuel Hebron I think I think it's he it's him in particular as well as several other other individuals in this this sort of taking for deal. Um, and they go to court and the court basically says, look, it's, it's right in, it's right in the school bill. Hmm. We don't have any choice. Um, so the school no, and the, the park, the park was also a part of that. So we want to create yes. this park. Well, well, so then, so then what happens is that, uh, with, when, with the inability of the, uh, 
um, uh, of the uh, of of the of this Hazen bill to go forward. This bill, this bill that sort of comes up with Hazen's idea. Um, what happens is that uh, at the same time, actually at the same months, uh, that that there's this back and forth on on the Capitol Hill. There's a back and forth about something called uh, of a bill that will create something called the National Capital Park and Planning Commission. So it creates this uh, large, powerful federal agency with a consistent appropriation to buy land and to build parks in DC. And it is essentially created to implement the Macmillan plan with adjustments to kind of, you know, 1930s ideas instead of uh, 1920s ideas instead of uh, 1900s ideas of what a park should be. And they, they do that. They ex basically execute the Macmillan plan downtown with a couple of changes, right? So Federal Triangle is no longer kind of a, a, a complex of museums, but instead uh, in, ple in pleasure gardens or whatever, it's now federal office building because the federal government got bigger, right? They, but they build the mall. Uh, you have to remember until until this time, the National Mall was was full of uh, like random office buildings and it had a, a very different configuration because it was previously different botanic gardens and all that, anyway. But they also start going out into the city and to, to building these, these parks and they get a lot of support from nationwide uh, as part of a park reform movement and this very interesting woman does it and they, they basically create this very power, federal powerful federal agency and they just start they start buying reno that fight is actually very very interesting because actually some of the members of the commission did not did of this national park and planning commission didn't think reno was worth it in particular there is one uh district commissioner who who really saw this as a way to expel uh, black people, and we know that uh, there's a there's a moment in one of their meetings where a man named Ulysses S. Grant III, who is the grandson of the Civil War general, uh, and was very important in um, in the history of DC, and particularly in the history of urban renewal later on, uh, who basically says, "Look, this is a, there have been a lot of ways people have been trying to get black people out of here for a while, and this is just another way to do it." Uh, to their kind of versions, and by this time they're starting to use as as Kim and Noel have, have alluded to, they're starting to use something called the Fort Drive or the Fort Circle project as a pretext uh, to, to, of why this park is so important. Because remember, most of the park land they're buying is vacant. Exactly. And most of the land around Reno was vacant. So why are they taking this land that is not vacant, right? I mean, there, you know, Wilson was vacant. Uh, everything north of Fessenden was vacant. Uh, there was old stuff in Tenleytown, sure, but it wasn't that much. It was rural, right. it was just a rural leftover. Um, so they're using this Fort Circle Drive as a pretext to, to, to claim the property. And the, the truth is, you know, Hazen's does stop kind of being involved at this point. It goes up to the to the next level of government um, and this this federal agency. But it's what's important to understand is that the person who really on on the commission is very very involved is a man named Frederick Olmsted Jr. Frederick Olmsted Jr. is one of the most important figures in American planning history. Um, he he was on this. He was on. Um, he was he led the American Society of Landscape Architects. I think he's. Uh, very involved in the development of the Standard Zoning Enabling Act, which is exactly. why there are yes. zoning everywhere in the United States. Um, and he uh, was on this commission. He, he had a very close relationship uh, with the, uh, the, uh, he seems to have been patronized by, the, by um, uh, Francis Newlands, Senator Francis Newlands and the Chevy Chase Land Company. Um, he also did the zoo. I mean, he, he's one of those, prolific. his firm is hugely prolific. Um, he, he did uh, Gallaudet University's campus too. Uh, yeah, I think that's the father, but yeah, it's same same idea. Oh, yeah, it's senior, but yeah, same firm. Um, and he, uh, they uh, did. Uh, uh, what was that? He, you know, basically, he he actually physically drove out to Reno and picked out what properties to take. And they actually be, they began actually by buying up vacant land uh, because a lot of the white residents who've been trying to kick Reno kick um, kick the Reno res sort of kick Reno out had actually been buying up uh, vacant land so that more African-Americans could not buy there. Um, and there seems to have been a conspiracy sort of led by Harold Doyle. It's really hard to find anything on that, but they, it's alluded to in a couple of letters. Um, and so they were able to buy that land. And then uh, new, originally Olmsted wants to buy a lot of land. Um, uh, he fights perplexingly with one of the, this other guy um, over a bit of time. And the solution was to buy first by just the vacant land. Um, and then by 1937, uh, 30, uh, they're starting to go in, into condemnation. So 1937 to 1941 is when they, they seize most of the land. Eminent domain. Is what, and and eminent domain, domain. Yes, domain. That's domain. correct. And that's at the same time, the Works Progress Administration. So while they're building the mall, while they're um, doing all this work, that's, that's uh, it's either Works Progress or Public Works Administration. I always get them confused. They send guys out and they actually tear down the houses at Reno. And the National Park Service has photographs, very evocative photographs from that, from that process. 
All right, so we now know we've got the whole outline. The history is there. Um, just the early forms of redlining and gentrification at its finest. Yep. But was Reno an isolated incident in Washington, D.C.? Uh, I, I would say no, but maybe, Noel, do you want to take this one? No, I mean, it depends on what we mean by, by like, do we mean like how it was done? I think it's, it's unique in some well, way. No, were there just other, were there other communities that, that saw the same plight of Reno residents? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, there was, there were uh, African American, if we're talking about African American communities, African American communities throughout um, Northwest DC yes. that were slowly, uh, different, uh, different mechanisms were used, uh, different pressures were applied. To, mm -hmm. But, um, but, you know, there was, uh, there once was an extremely um, uh, uh, lively community of African Americans in Georgetown yes. that um, the and still remain to this day when you look at the churches, but representation as far as home ownership is no longer there. Um, it's a similar sort of story, except done differently. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't in the same way. Um, also the ADA, if I'm not mistaken, there were several other housing projects that still exist to this day that were sort of part of that initial pushing people out of one area and, and moving them to another, another place. I think, um, uh, I wrote down a couple of them, and I and I would like to check to make sure that uh, that Neil agrees with these. But I think uh, Fort Dupont dwellings was one of them. Um, Hopkins apartments. Um, there's a couple over in Southeast as well. That these were places where people were were they fixed the homes, they put, left them there, but they also there was a lot of displacement. I mean, um, you know, when we think of the way that we that the city is sort of the racial lines that exist in the city today. They were definitely not existing in the same way yes. um, during most of the uh, 19th and early 20th century. And it isn't until pretty much the interwar period, or right before, um, right, right during the war, that a lot of the change, you know, as, as DC's population explodes, you know, we we get uh, during the during World War II, I believe, we get about a million residents living, or almost a million residents living in the city it transforms who lives where. And a lot of the movements that happen um, begin at that point. And so that's when you start seeing Anacostia really change into what Anacostia, the way we right. think of Anacostia today. Right. Um, and so uh, it's it's not unique in any way. And unfortunately, it's really the story of DC. Um, I think that it, it's interesting when you think about uh, Northwest DC, if, especially if you grew up around here, and Neil, you grew up around here, and Kim as well. We think of, of things being stable, and this is yes. the way it's been. And when you start digging just a little bit deeper, you start realizing that, you know, just you know before the 1950s, the city really was not organized in the way that we think of it today, at least racially. Yes. And Absolutely. the hardening of those racial covenants um, didn't really. I, they, they were working. You know, these things were happening. At, you know, for a long period of time, but really the solidifying of where people could buy. The way that you could even get uh, mortgages if you could get them, you know, who was selling the homes, where they could sell them, it became it became um, uh, more organized the way that that was being done. And in fact, I think that there's a lot of evidence to show that the whole entire redlining that started happening uh, was very actively sought in a very specific way. Yes, um, very intentional, very yeah. intentional. So this, so this intentionality really, I think, uh, lays you know creates a city that, that we come to think of today yes. and but it doesn't take very much to 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 find evidence of african-american communities throughout northwest dc in fact especially in georgetown very affluent and well-established communities that still have churches to this day yep. right off of right off of m street yep. um, that are worth visiting because uh, you visit the cemetery and you see you just realize the immensity of these churches and how important they were to african-american civic life Yep. Yeah, there were three of them in Reno, three black churches in Reno. Yep. So I, I want to thank you all. I, I want to pause. We've got just a few, just a few more. I know we've got lots of questions in the chat box. I'm, I'm eager to take those questions, but you know, I wanted to leave with what's left in Reno. What's left of Reno City? Um, how do we make sense of Melvin Haven? Help Melvin Melvin Hazen's and the, the whole historical context and how the world has changed around us. What's, how, how, what does that look like? You know, we, we now know Reno, it's a beautiful park. 
Um, the Reno School is still there and now part of the Deal uh, Middle School. So do you all want to share that before we sort of go to our chat box to see what kind of questions are out there? That's a hard question of what remains. I mean, I guess it depends on what you mean by remains. Uh, there's like lights, you know, I, I, I asked the park recently, like, you know, today I was like, you know, what does remain? Um, and there's some, you know, street lights that still remain and fire hydrants and a couple of, you know, uh, foundations of homes from the last few ones that, that still are there. But I think when we think about like what remains, there's uh, legacies and stories that are that, that really remain. And I think that that's more of my domain, but I think that that is a real powerful thing that that is, it, you know, it's not on the landscape, but it is in the way that we think of the city. And I think an important part of the work that hopefully the park is doing, that I'm doing, that Neil's doing, is to sort of bring these stories to the fore so that we can think of interpretation when we're thinking about these, these um, landscapes. Because um, if, if it's about what is actually left on the landscape, there's, I don't, I, I can't think of very much physically. Um, Neil, do you know if anything that physically remains or is that not the type of remain we're talking about here? I mean, there are, uh, there are, well, this is like, in terms of physical remains, there's, there's the, yeah, the fire hydrants, uh, there was the most prominent, there's some kind of depressed divots. You can kind of see stuff. There's a single piece of sidewalk. Um, there's a, there's a, a very prominent look of the Chesapeake house, which isn't really part of Reno. It's actually kind of an accident. It wasn't, um, it has to do with the mix up at the department of buildings. Um, they, they actually were, it's a long story. I'm not going to get into that. The, um, but there are, there are two or three houses that were duplexes that I, I can't tell if they were part of Reno properly, but they sit on, they sit on the outer edge of the Dyer farm. Um, they are now on Nebraska Avenue. There's like three houses uh, that are kind of older looking uh -huh. and are at a funny angle from, from Nebraska Avenue. That's part of, that's part of, that's really all that's there. The Reno School and Howard, Howard Street Right, it's Howard Street or Howard Road? Uh, Howard that, Street. Howard Street, yeah. Howard Road is somewhere else. Um, Howard South, Southeast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Howard Street is uh, Howard Street is kind of really the only re remnant, really, of uh, and the Reno School and the, and, and the Reno School is you know had a very strange history. I mean, it was right. It was it was almost it was closed in 1950 or 51, um, and maybe you guys remember. Um, and then it was uh, used for the civil uh, civil aeronautical defense right or civil def and it had these weird antennas out of it for years it's something to do with like nuclear stuff and then and then it was uh, briefly a, for for um special needs students and now it's and that now is was renovated finally and put as, as part of deal um but it, that's kind of the let me be more philosophically ask this question because like how do you how do you what is the absence of evidence like how do you it was the, how do you talk about the absence of something? And I want to say that two ways because we know Melvin Hazen's name, right? Um, and we don't know, no one, we don't really, we've only learned James Neal's name recently, right? We've only, uh, it's only because someone sort of got picked him out of the, picked him out of an old box of papers. And um, that's kind of the tough thing. It's like, we don't, we don't know what we don't know about Reno because some of it wasn't recorded. It wasn't seen as important. Um, and we, we only know, uh, evidence of things that have been removed, things that are gone. It's very difficult to talk about these things. So even though it's, it's easy to find you know, maybe one or two bad things, someone like Hazen has done, and well, he did a lot of bad things, but um, the, it's even harder to find the, the, th the people and what, the, what, what people who were not written about were what they did. It's harder to, to uncover these people who deserve more attention than they, than they were given in their time um, and in their afterlife. So uh, I think that's maybe more of the question is, you know, we could talk about what, what's Reno there, what's Reno there, but like we got, it's hard to see what we are missing, it's my, yeah. my opinion. Well, I wanna thank you all. We're gonna stop for a moment now and um, check in with the monitors who are monitoring the chat box and see if we have any questions. They're gonna read those questions and then either of you all can take, um, take a stab at it. I wanna thank you all for your time this afternoon. We're not quite done, but I wanna thank you for your responses and <laughs> the dialogue we've had tonight. Hit me. Um, all right, and thank you, Kim, for moderating that discussion. That was um, fantastic. And apologies if these are out of order in which they came. Um, I think this is pulling on something that maybe Kim said about this, could, or no, Noel, you said it could make a movie. Someone asked if there is any um, 
if there are any films or fiction works that capture the the story of Reno. No, but there should be. <laughs> no, what Neil Smith's project is. Call me. Okay. Um, maybe any any historical fiction that captures the era and some of these themes that you've been talking about. Um, <laughs> there is that there's that novel about DC. There's that no, there's an epistle, epistolary novel about DC, but being like a black middle class in DC. Do you know what that is? No, I don't think I've, I've read a novel about about that. We will have it, to find it and have a. We'll follow up with a book club. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, and honestly, uh, Neil, I think just real quick, I think it's an interesting question you're posing about what do you do in the absence of something. Yeah. Um, as a uh, as an uh, ardent Freudian sort of person, I think that when things are omitted and and forgotten, uh, they manifest in different ways. And so I think that um, that even though we may not be able to um, see the people that were that were on the landscape problems that they experienced and the same issues that people are experiencing today is a form of manifestation of the of the sort of the same trauma yeah. you know sure. displaced from places and so there's there's a continuation of the story yes even if it's with someone new and so the, i think that that's it's not the same person but it is the same plight and connects people in really powerful ways. And I think that's an important part of the work that yes. has been done here is it's a way of grounding experiences today in things that happened in the past. Absolutely. Um, and we've had one suggestion come in for books um, of the era and that's All Aunt Hagar's Children by Edward P. Jones. And it's about apparently around the convention center area. Um, Maybe someone could place that information in the chat box. Yeah. We will get that out and we'll also send up a follow-up email um, working as fast as we can. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> someone else mentioned Chinatown, which covers the ground rules of how power and politics works. And we have another suggestion. The, I think this is not fiction, The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, which uh -huh. is the um, history of how our government has segregated America. And I guess the question is, which Chinatown we're talking about? The original Chinatown or the one? Oh, we have? there we go. I'll we'll have to Take watch them. The plan. Yeah. Yep. Um, next, we'll be doing a watch party where Neil and Noel both um, watch historical fiction and commentate <laughs> on this. Okay, that'll be our next program. Um, somebody asked if there are any living former residents, or Noel, you also mentioned looking for descendants um, of Reno who can share stories. Um, living former residents, I think that there are. I think that there, there, there's been some identified in, in a, that as part of um, a study that was done with the Park Service. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's any living uh, today, and I'd have to go back and, and take a, and look through that. But I do know that there have been people who were part of that, and I know that um, uh, there's a possibility that, that there can be some still today. I mean, there's no reason why not. I think the last people who lived in Reno was 19. 50 maybe somewhere around there so there's no reason that there isn't people who are still living that can remember but i don't know of anyone who comes to the top of mind who's uh, who's currently living that we can actually talk to about about that so it'd be, I'd be interested in hearing more of anyone who has a connection with reno if they remember anyone who lives Absolutely. there and i'm sure there's some descendants um or former residents that were forced out to prince george's county and montgomery county and other areas that could probably you know share stories of their families living in what we once upon a time we lived in washington dc um so yeah. i know that noel's working on a, a number of those sort of projects to yeah, help us continue to tell those stories in the park what's yeah. interesting is some of the few places that 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 still are around from that period of time that didn't get displaced have become these strange little isolates yeah. that exist in 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 you know in our region including uh i think uh toby town is one of them yeah definitely a prominent African-American community that is in Potomac, but that is completely isolated. And um, you don't even, you know, most people don't even know that, it, that it's out there. So um, it, I'm certain that it's the possibility of there being, and as we uncover more and go through the church records, I'm sure we can probably find some people that might remember, um, but uh -huh. I don't know of anyone as of yet. So if anyone here knows of anyone, uh, we, you know, I'd love to hear. All right. Um, Oh, sorry, Kim. 
No, I was asking, do you have any more questions? We sure do. Good, um, good. <laughs> yeah. So sort of related to that, one asked if there are any efforts or ways to compensate earlier Reno residents for their economic loss? And if not, what would a mechanism be? There, there are no mechanisms at this point. And I, I think that um, this is, a, you know, Reno was very bad, but it's, it's really um, nothing compared to some of the things that would happen later in the 20th century. Um, even up until to aspects of gentrification today. I mean, uh, when we talk about where other, there are other incidents where um, people were displaced, uh, right? I mean, set the, when the, the urban renewal of Southwest, I think, well, Reno was something like 300 people uh, probably were displaced uh, in the course in over, over 10 years. Um, in Southwest, I think like tw it was like 22,000 people were displaced in two years. Um, and, um, you know, similar things at Berry Farm. People know Berry Farm as a public housing uh, area, but it was, that actually was built. It was, that, that actually was a community that dates back to 1867. So uh, when uh, Suitland Parkway was carved through that, huh? Berry Farm was, was like six times bigger than you. If, if you have a picture of what Berry Farm is in your head, it's like six times bigger originally. Uh, so the construction of the Anacostia Freeway and Suitland Parkway did, did things like that. And, um, so is there a compensation? Like, no, there should be, but there, there is not. Um, but I think we need to, it's good to look at these things systematically. And the thing that I, I hope we take away from this is that we can't just sort of look at Melvin Hazen and say, um, Melvin Hazen was uh, the guy and he, we just get rid of his name and everything's solved. It's gonna be much bigger. Even when we talk about names, you know, uh, two people, three people who were in that, that, back, that 1924 back room meeting were Harry Wardman, uh, Charles Glover, um, and, um, and Frank Ballou. So all these, these people who actually have names elsewhere and we haven't done this systematically. So names systematically and then and, and, and compensation reparations of some kind and systematically. Wait a minute, are the Wardman homes named after Wardman? Yes. There we go. <laughs> Frank W. Ballou has a high school over in Southeast DC. Yeah. And Glover Park has a lot of things. The Glover has a lot of things. <laughs> Like Glover Park. Um, someone mentioned Kathleen Lesko, Black Georgetown Remembered. Also, we had a question, and this might speak to that idea of, um, you know, what is an absence? Someone asked about if there might still be foundations under the park or other perhaps underground archaeology. And I know we have the, I think Brad from the park is on the line too. Um, I, I don't know of that, unfortunately. I stopped uh, studying when we got to archaeology. So we'd have to, we'll have to rely on, on, I mean, there is some foundations that, that are- We identical. do, there are, yes. There's, um, you know, there's uh, divots in the, in, on, the, on the landscape, which clearly were roads, because, you know, th th those types of depressions only occur when people traverse and people are carrying stuff across it. Um, and I think that, uh, that, like this is totally out there, but I know that I've seen at least in the little wooded area, there's things growing, which usually indicate like this specific types of, of, um, of plants growing that seem to, to indicate that there might've been like a small garden or something because, you know, onions and other things that, that normally aren't just part of our lands you know, don't just pop up anyway. Sure. Um, but, I, but as far as anything bigger, I think that um, uh, we'd have to ask Brad if there's anything identical been identified um i what we know is there actually are there are oral histories that are kept at the dc um, historical society so this reno was reno was not completely forgotten in the 1970s there was actually a, a somewhat of a of, of, a, of an interest in it this is kind of there was a 1970s fad for local history um uh and it, for there was some interest in that and they actually they actually did in that oral history project interview descendants um, and the descendants used to have a picnic actually on Fort Reno, according to a Washington Post article about that, uh, or, or people who, who had formerly lived there. Um, but the oral history includes an interview with people, some of the workers who demolished the houses. And they, they said that what they would do is they would tear the houses down, uh, throw the construction degree into the foundation and then light that on fire. Um, and then just cover it with dirt once the fire had gone out. So there's, the foundations are almost certainly still there. Um, well, great. We had another question. I think it came up when you all were talking about the Alley Dwelling Authority about um, if there are any specifics about Blagden Alley or maybe if it's connected to that piece. 
Well, there's a tremendous resource out there called Alley Life. I think it's called uh, the book's Washington Alley Life or Alley Life in Washington. Alley Life in Washington by Borkert. Yeah, that that I think is a that I mean, there's it's it's kind of dated, but it's a it's a tremendous resource, and I guess we can put it in the um, the chat section if you because it really breaks down um, alley by alley. I think it might have been written in the '60s, so it's got or it might be earlier than that. Um, it's got great detail as far as what you know what each alley looked like and the composition, a racial composition of many of the alleys. Um, so it gives you a sense of really what that was like, and it's a lot more. Um, it's a lot more uh, um, lively than you might imagine. I think that we think of it in one way, but the, these alleys weren't just, it, it isn't the alleys that we have today. They were a lot larger so that people can traverse behind them yes. and, and um, uh, you know, clean out whatever, you know, there was a lot of work that needed this. There was a lot of people that could, that, could, that would be um, all stuffed in the back of them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, there were there were a number of them that were very well kept up, very yes. well kept up. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's true that a lot of the dwellings didn't have plumbing or whatever, but you know, they're if 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 they really want if they really wanted to improve their condition, they could have given them plumbing. Which, you know, in, in sometimes in Southwest Urban Renewal, they actually preserved buildings. They didn't clean down all the they, they would they gut the buildings and then resell them. So they, they went through the process of saving the buildings, but um, and they could have done that too. Um, in um in, in the alleys, but um. The, I think the most important reason, well, in addition to that, to that book and some oral histories have done, I mean, there really are astonishing uh, resources on the alleys uh, at the DC archives from these uh, really generic and boring uh, DC um, project management files from the night, early 1900s. I mean, really, really incredible amounts of information uh, block by block uh, that has never really been delved into. And it's mostly because the DC archives is not particularly well uh, kept up and has been kind of neglected by, um, by the DC government. So if you are if you are a resident of Columbia, write to a council member and say you're very interested in the DC archives. That's my pitch because um, there there is a lot of history in there that we just we haven't even touched. Um, we had a question asking for some clarification about Chesapeake House and its relationship to Reno. You know, we touched on that briefly, but if you could say a little bit more, maybe recap. You opened yourself up to this one. I know. Okay, Ches Chesapeake House was built in, I think, 1938. Um, what happened is that uh, after the first round of clearances, so there, there's, a, there's a, a voluntary purchase that occurs beginning in 1930-31 by the National Park and Planning Commission. 1931 to 19 uh, is the sort of voluntary phase for them uh, to 1937-38. Uh, they basically, the land that uh, right on Chesapeake Street, they do not originally attempt to. So I don't know if you saw the slides. There was a slide with a map of the areas that uh, were taken when that area was left off kind of as like, hold on, we'll, we'll, we'll come to this when we get to it. So the area right on Nebraska Avenue and the right area right on Chesapeake. Um, they eventually, uh, but they were supposed to stop the construction of all buildings. They were supposed to have a freeze on building permits in that area. Um, someone didn't get the memo or who knows what uh, down at the department of buildings. So someone, a plumbing company uh, I think, or as a, someone, or this, some, someone built us that building in 1938, sort of just because they could, um, and it was occupied by a plumbing company and then a tenant uh, on the on the. The family lived room. upstairs. There was a family, yeah. the, the the plumbing company's family. It was it was the okay interesting. Um, so that I don't know the later history, but yeah, that's that's kind of how it got built. So it's not really part of Reno, but it's interesting. It's 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 in the plat. If you if you look on the street, it's like in the street. Because it's it's not on the or the street grid. So, is this the house that later on was used by the punks in the uh, 70s? Or, okay, okay. Is I that, think you might need to say a little bit more about the punks, Noel. I don't know about I mean, the this. We we really don't want to get into that, but what's but I mean I don't want to open that that. Fair enough. That would, that would be me here for another hour, but I think that that's it's interesting the way just thinking about me, just growing up in the city how the displacement of certain people allowed for the arts to flourish, you know, these right. sorts of things, because, uh, you know, depressed housing allows for artists to sort of get, anyway, that's another presentation for the day. All right. Um, we had a question about whether uh, Hazen, sorry, I was gonna say Reno, Hazen's dying in office um, added to the, the naming of him. If yeah, prob probably. I mean, he was very dramatic. I mean, when he, when he died, 
when he died, I mean, he he had a, his uh, uh, funeral cortege or whatever, uh, you know, was was like a, a an event that people went to go look at. I mean, he he, um, you know, he he uh, it was his funeral was attended by the lead, leaders of the district kind of business community, um, and he. Um, you know, he was he was apparently beloved enough that people came out and watched the cortege go by. Um, I, think it's, I think it's the right word. Cortege, am I right? Okay, okay. Um, and then he, you know, he's buried out in Manassas. He's buried out in Manassas Cemetery. Um, the, uh, you know, that it probably did. And I, I guess that he, you know, he was just, it just seemed like, I think, I think he just really was well, from what I remember the, they just appreciated that he was involved in acquiring land for Rock, for Rock Creek. And he may have had some hand in, Melvin Hazen Park, but they simply thought that as a tribute. So it, it's named about six months later, I think, for him in December. He dies in June. Um, so for those who don't know, he actually died literally in his office of a heart yeah. attack. Yeah. In the, in the district. For the Wilson dramatic. Yeah. yeah, very dramatic. Um, uh, let's see, we had a question about whether there are any internet accessible photos of the alley dwellings and the Reno houses and streets. And maybe I'd extend that to Neil, you mentioned the archives being a great resource. Are they digitally or digitized rather? No, the DC archives is very poorly digitized, but the, the Library of Congress uh, does have a lot of alley photographs, photographs of alleys. They're particularly uh, from a big range of period. They, like they've been, they were photographed a whole bunch of times. And I think there's a one, at least one, there's these really beautiful photographs from that period. Um, and I think, I think it's, you know, they were done by a black photographer instead of a white photographer for once that really captures kind of the lives of these people. I can't remember his name, but if you yeah. Google that, maybe, do you know, Noel? No, I don't know, but I know that the, um, I want to say the Washington Post several years back did like a photo series on, on Alley showing what they were like back then and the, the changes, because there's still, you know, in certain parts of the city, there's still some of the remnants of those homes uh, still exist to this day. Absolutely. I think that they, they, there was a couple of people doing tour groups of those alleys and so the Washington Post followed up by showing what alley life looked back then versus what, what remains today. Um, so uh, it's, I think if you, if you look it up, I know that there's been several artists have done reinterpretations and Definitely. 3D imaging. So there's, there's a lot out there. If you just look up DC alley life, you, you'll, you'd be surprised what you find. The, the, yeah, and the, the Tally Town Historical Society has some photographs on their page of Reno. Um, there's, uh, the, that, but again, there's a lot of photographs that aren't. I mean, in, in the, at the uh, National Archives, in the records of the uh, National Capital Planning Commission, they photographed. So there's a lot of there's a lot of photographs that have been seen and digitized of um, the that you can find online of the demolition and some stuff done by the National Park Service. Um, but before that, uh, the, when they would acquire a building in Reno, they photographed every single house. Right? There's a huge collection of photographs that just has never been scanned and digitized because it's buried in these records. So it's, again, there's a lot of stuff that just isn't touched yet. Now, anyone, anyone wanting to get a do a, anyone who's interested in doing like a thesis or a dissertation, so just going down there and helping organize and seeing what's in there is I I would if if it were just a little bit better organized, the amount of resources that are in there is just immense. And so you get a little glimpse of what's in there. But it's just, needs, it needs some care. Well, um, on the note of care, I think that um, we are probably out of time for more questions, but I want to express my appreciation for how much care um, everybody who took the time out this evening to participate in this program. Um, and I will get to you wonderful speakers in just a moment, but I want to make sure um, that we do not we are not remiss in thanking the people that maybe have not been seen or heard this evening. Um, from Rock Creek Conservancy, our amazing community engagement team led by Elena Smith, Maya, Brianna, um, really appreciate all the work that you've put in um, at Rock Creek Park, the incredible team, including Brad and Dana. I see Nick is here, Rita and others who helped make this evening possible. I am so very grateful. Um, and I am just so grateful to all of you who are interested in exploring this intersection of race, history and Rock Creek with us. We started last year with the the Chocolate City book talk. And um, I think we might have come up with ideas for about 12 more besides those we had already planned just in the course of the conversation this evening. 
Um, and of course, I am thankful for the amazing weather we are having this week. I hope you take this as an opportunity to see some of the places that came up in conversation today. Remember to wear your mask when you're out in the park. Um, and with that, I am going to give the last word to Julia. Well, thank you, Jean, Jeannie, and I. I, uh, I reiterate all your th all the thanks and gratitude that you just shared, um, especially uh, you know to the people behind the scenes. Really appreciate that, and our terrific speakers and moderator today. So thank you all so much. Um, you know, this has been really, really interesting for me. Um, I grew up in Northwest DC. I went to Ben Merch Elementary School, Alice Deal Junior High, and uh, Woodrow Wilson High School. And in all that time growing up in, in Upper Northwest DC, never once did I hear anything about any of this history. Um, and I'm just so grateful following on the gratitude theme that, uh, that we're, we're working on uncovering it and bringing it out. And it's going to be, um, you know, these stories, these untold stories and these pieces of buried history that were systematically buried, you know, Rock Creek Park is committed to continuing to tell those stories and to bring them to light and to work with, you know, scholars like uh, Noel and, and Neil and others to try to um, verify and, and draw out more stories. Imagine what's in those archives, right? That Imagine. we could, could actually interpret and tell people about and share. So I'm excited. We have so much opportunity here um, and such an important uh, story to tell about the intersection of race and history and Rock Creek Park. Um, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the series and all that we can do in the future to uh, interpret this important information. Um, so with that, I'm going to say good night and thank you all so much for coming. All right. Thank you again, everybody. Have a great night. Be safe thank out you there. All. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh. Great job. Very enlightening.